In 2022, the state court invalidated assembly lines created earlier that year by the state legislature, finding that lawmakers had deviated from the redistricting process in New York's constitution. And while a similar finding was made about the new congressional and state Senate boundaries, the timing of the ruling on the assembly lines resulted in the redistricting process being kicked back to the state's bipartisan redistricting commission, which was tasked with coming up with new lines for the People's House that would be used in 2024 and beyond. And on April 20th, after months of soliciting public input on a draft plan, the redistricting commission submitted assembly lines that were subsequently written into state law. To discuss the process and the product, as well as what might come next for the commission, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Ken Jenkins, a Democratic appointee to the commission who serves as its chair. Welcome to the show, Ken. I really appreciate being here with you this morning. So the lines that were approved by the commission and since signed into law are very similar to the boundaries lawmakers created for the assembly last year. So how did you end up with these lines based on the draft proposal that was backed by the commission uh, in the fall of 2022 when it was reconvened? Under court order, under the Nichols case, to be able to have a do-over for the Independent Redistricting Commission, where the process, the constitutional process for doing the redistricting was going to move forward. And the members of the commission started with basically a consensus map where the Independent Redistricting Commission left off. That was prior certainly to my appointment and certainly Yovan Collado's appointment. And I think there was one Republican member, I think that's Lisa Harris's um, appointment, to be able to come up to a working draft that was one unanimous from the uh, commission members to present to the people of the state of New York um, pursuant to the state constitution. So we held 12 uh, public hearings. And in those public hearings, people expressed their, cons- um, their, their thoughts on whether or not they wanted changes based on the communities of interest, make things that people wanted to be consistent with the 2022 legislative lines, and that's what they may have advocated for. So we had over 3,000 um, comments that were made. We had 300 people speaking in person. From a testimony perspective, we went over 20 hours of testimony in those uh, those particular sessions. So where people were able to advocate and make modifications, almost half of the comments were to maintain the current legislative lines. So if District 1, for example, so in District 1, if people advocated to maintain District 1 and they didn't say anything about District 2, there would be modifications that would end up from a result that District 2 or the things that were contiguous to those might have to change as well. And we certainly made modifications in putting communities together based on the comments that came in front of us, communities of interest together, and certainly at the end of the day, have an analysis done by the expert, Dr. Lisa Hanley, which was selected by the commission, again, jointly, to be able to analyze and make sure that we were not running afoul of any voter rights activity. So at the end of the day, that analysis was done. The legislative lines were modified based on the comments that we heard. And, and then we were able to have that in consideration for the vote that happened on um, on April 20th. And as you pointed out in the opening, um, that was voted on, adopted by both houses of the legislature and signed by the governor yesterday on April 24th. In reference to the near unanimous approval of assembly lines by the commission, you were quoted in the Times Union saying, quote, this vote is ultimately a victory for the commission process. Why do you see it that way, as opposed to this vote and the crafting of lines for the assembly as being the product of a unique circumstance? Well, uh, because, again, one of the things that we we did talk through um, when we were doing presentations, how many times do you get to, to do it over? Right. So in my opening comments, I made sure to to reference that, you know, we had a unanimous vote by the independent redistricting commission members back in December of 2022, when we had a draft set of maps. And then we we had a nine to one vote on the final set of maps. And again, that just says that the process, and I know that there's some, some folks that have articulated concerns over the years about the redistricting process right from the very beginning in 2014, when it was adopted by referendum in the state of New York, that anytime you would have a five to five group 
where there was not a, a majority from the Republicans or the Democrats, that that was a recipe for failure. And I would say the opposite. Um, with Vice Chair Charlie Nesbitt and myself, we were looking through this as this is an opportunity for us to come to consensus and to come to compromise and having conversation. And again, listening to the people of the state of New York on what they would like to see as far as their assembly districts in the 12 different public hearings that we had. And there were certainly folks that would like to see different things. We all were very clear that it was never gonna be, there's no such thing as a perfect map, but there was a lot of adherence, um, complete adherence to the process as outlined in the constitution. And again, having it being able to be done over, having a process that this was really the first time through, right? So, you know, with, from our um, the previous commission members, um, when they were unable to come up with a single set of maps from the commission, and then when they didn't have the opportunity to come up with a second set of maps, quite frankly, again, we said that the working group sessions that we had in the draft map that was presented in um, December of 2020 was a result of the compromise that said basically between the two sets of maps. And it was clear from all of the litigation that occurred that compromise and um, cooperation and being able to work together um, on both sides of the aisle was essential in getting this done. And, and again, I want to continue to say what I said that day was um, thanking all of the commission members for their, the, their tremendous work. And certainly the vice chair, Charlie Nesbitt, who was the, the leader on the Republican side, if you will, for the work and the, the cooperation and the navigation through a, a very, very difficult process where we were listening to all the people of the state of New York uh, that decided to make their voices heard. Well, for listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with Ken Jenkins, a Democratic appointee to the state's Bipartisan Redistricting Commission, which he serves as the chair of. By one analysis uh, created by an expert from CUNY, 45 of the districts are exactly the same. Another 65 are at least 99% the same. And the additional, I think, 31 are about 95 to 99% of copies of the 2022 map. And I think only nine of the remaining ones are uh, less than 94% the same. So given the similarities between the proposal from the legislature and what the commission came up with. Do we even need the commission? Could we just say that the legislature does a pretty good job of drawing the lines and they should just be trusted to continue that process? Well, no, that's not what the people in New York said. And and that's why, again, it it was tremendous that we had an opportunity um, to do it over, um, to to have a process that we basically began not from scratch, but began from the beginning of the process where there was a draft map and again, a unanimous one draft map (laughs) Um, and then be able to listen to the people of New York not having to decide between plan A and plan B and then not being able to come to a compromise from the commission itself where the legislature then um, had the technical error um, on both sets of litigation um, and then the difference with the um, the gerrymandering version that was thrown out by the Hoffman case. So again, with this, when the special master came in to draw those lines, I think it's really important that the legislative process that is dictated under the state constitution um, get a chance to continue to move forward, right? So I think that that the the conversations and people that have input to say, well, these things didn't change that much. And well, they they did change. And we started with a, a, say, a major significant change where the 101st assembly district that went through seven, seven counties and 26 school districts was now, um, now only four, <laughs> four different counties. And I don't know the number of school districts, but again, trying to move in that direction. But that's, that's the outlier though, Ken, that, that district, you know, looking at the maps, that one district is the outlier compared to more than a, a hundred. David, to your point is like, li- listen, as the constitution required, and I didn't make sure to mention that then, the commission um, focused and considered the maintenance of cores of existing districts of pre-existing political subdivisions, including the county, cities, towns, and the communities of interest. So if the members of the legislature came up with something that um, made sense that people advocated for, 
That's what the advocation was about. So people could come out and talk about the communities of interest, not about members. And, and certainly we made that comment um, along the way as well. This is not about members. This is about the communities of interest and those you know, um, political subdivisions like the counties, cities, towns, and villages, trying to make sure that we kept folks together as much as possible. And again, we listened strongly to that and we did make modifications in um, doing some things along the lines and whether people think that was enough. Well, I, again, that's up into their interpretation, gotcha. but we, we worked very hard in listening to those folks. So there's currently a legal challenge designed to give the redistricting commission another crack at drawing New York's congressional boundaries uh, for 2024. Do you want that authority? Um, if the commission is ready, willing and able to move forward with whatever decisions happen. If the court determines that the Independent Redistricting Commission is going to have an opportunity to do this again, as uh, happened with the Nichols case, that that's what we will do. We will move forward and we will do this process and we'll um, pretty much have kind of an outline of what it would look like based on what we had here. Um, again, it's not something that we want to do or not want to do, right? I think that the, the members of the commission um, as a whole would say if we had additional time in 2022 when all of this um, the litigations occurred, then we might have been able to come to that point. I think with one of the greatest things that the litigations did do was show everyone that the, the process was required to have the commission do its work and that because it was a 5-5 and it is a 5-5 commission that there has to be the compromise and going forward and and that may not have been everyone's um, point of view at the particular point in time but I know with the commissioners that we have now that they're strong adherence to whatever we get um, directed to do um, and be able to move forward I'm certain that at the end of the day, there may be um, suggestions that come about after all of the things are said and done. We're not at that point in time right now. So we'll have to wait and see how everything turns out. And then we'll be able to move forward should we be pressed into service to do so. I've been advised by my colleagues on uh, the, my colleagues that are commissioners that should we go through this um, process again um, with the 12 public hearings, it probably will not have the same level of of, of non-intensity that we had in the in the assembly lines but you know what I, I think again having the people of new york have an opportunity to have their voice heard um through this legislative process that they adopted through referendum is the right thing to do from a conceptual point of view but whether that happens or not is not up to to me or any other one of our commissioners but we are ready willing and able to do the work should that be what a court directs us to do well, yeah, you kind of just touched on it there by referencing, say, the, the intensity of, of the potential future conversations, considering how the stakes were comparatively low for drawing assembly lines compared to Congress, because really, no matter how you drew up assembly lines, Democrats were going to hang on to a vast majority in the chamber, whereas congressional lines, as we saw in 2022, play a major factor into control of the House of Representatives. So the stakes are much higher. So what incentive is there for Democrats or Republicans on the commission to potentially compromise if you are tasked with drawing congressional lines again? Well, I think that the the, the reality is if you go back and you look at the product, the work product from the Independent Redistricting Commission, if the similar items would occur, you would see the same kind of things that more time would have given the independent redistricting commission an opportunity to come up with one map. I mean, they, they were pretty intractable at the end, speaking with the former you know, chair and vice chair, Ken Martins and David Imamora, they basically said, nope, the other side was not willing to budge. They weren't willing to move. They wouldn't meet us halfway. So it didn't seem like time was the issue. It seemed like they had reached philosophical disagreements about how to proceed. But again, since, since now everyone has the benefit of whatever things occurred, now I think that there's a difference in interpretation. Um, certainly um, both Jack Martin and David Imamura have both uh, been elected in their own um, respects for the offices they chose to run for. Both Charlie Nesbitt um, as our vice chair and myself, 
worked extremely cooperatively with all of the, the folks together in trying to assure that we were listening to the comments as they were coming along. And every commissioner participated at that level. So I think, again, there's a, just a different overall mindset instead of the court as it has done over the last few years in the congressional lines. I'm, I'm, I don't have this record off the top of my head, um, but but I'm sure that you did, could find that out, David. Is um, I believe the court has made the congressional lines maybe the last three times. Uh, so um, I think that the people of the state of New York um, wanted to put in place a redistricting commission, not have one of the major political parties have an advantage over the other, and that is a requirement for the compromise through this process. And again, as you were suggesting, the stakes may be different, but I don't believe that the the leadership, meaning the, the chair and vice chair in the case, Charlie Nesman and myself, would not do anything different, but try to work together and cooperatively with all of our commissioners to make sure the voices are heard. Um, at the end of the day, we understand that the map did not have to have a unanimous vote. It just needed to have a majority of votes, and that would be what would be submitted to the legislature. So it doesn't have to be a unanimous vote. It's great when it is, but a nine to one vote is an overwhelmingly an overwhelming majority of the commissioners that felt strongly that the maps that we did were true to our requirements and true to what we were supposed to do as the members of the Independent Redistricting Commission. So again, the, we are prepared to do that work, um, should that be the case. Um, and and where we would be is just kind of in a holding pattern and we'll see what happens. But again, no one quote unquote wants to do something. I think that it's really just a, um, a tremendous accomplishment um, from the Independent Redistricting Commission to either get across this particular line and we'll see how it goes. Well, we've been speaking with Ken Jenkins. He is a Democratic appointee to the state's bipartisan redistricting commission, which he serves as chair of. Ken, thank you so much for making the time and congrats on getting the assembly lines across the finish line. They really appreciate that. Thank you for, for spending the time and, and, and happy to talk with you. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the independent power producers of New York. IPNY's annual Clean Energy Spring Conference and Showcase is set for May 9th and 10th at the Albany Capitol Center. More information at IPPNY.org.